always when I start a novel, I have to struggle to find wh what is going to make these characters come alive to me. Here's a historical record, which I have to say is often written in a way so boring that nobody of any sensibility would ever read it. The Wars of the Roses is a classic of this because it's fundamentally military history. It's been written by military historians who are not known for their insight into the wellsprings of human nature and their response to passion. They don't want to know about that sort of thing. They want to describe set-piece battles and how they work. So you start off with this really very, very dry history. And I start to discover these characters who are clearly marrying for love, who are clearly murdering in hot blood. And I start to go, this is, this is going to be a fascinating book. But how am I going to get, as it were, a handle on Elizabeth Woodville, who is at the very center of this book? You know, she is Edward's wife, she is the mother of the princess. This is a woman I have to warm to and become deeply interested in. And then I was reading a little little book about her, her mother, and it said Jaquetta is a descendant of the Counts of Luxembourg, of the Dukes of Burgundy, the only royal family in Europe to trace their ancestry back to a goddess. And this historian had just written this, like, you know, and here are other interesting things. And I went, Stop! What? How amazing, how, how unspeakably exciting is this? So then I looked up the goddess, and this is indeed the water goddess, Melusina. And we know her legend from our own fairy tales, and we know our leg her legend because you just, in Europe, you just brought up with it. This is the typical scenario whereby there's a clearing in the forest, the knight comes riding through, there's a big fountain in the forest, rising out of the fountain, half naked, is a beautiful, beautiful woman with a fish, like, uh, with a tail like a fish. She's a mermaid type thing. He proposes marriage to her, of course, <laughs> could be more natural. She accepts on the condition that she either, the story varies, she either has time alone in privacy, perhaps once a month, or that uh, she must have a room to bathe in and she mustn't be observed. They marry, they have beautiful children, they build a beautiful castle, they are completely, famously happy. And one day, tragically, he breaks the prohibition and he sees her. And he sees that she is, in fact, using the time on her own to revert to fish. And in some stories, she is so offended that he should break her privacy that she leaves him. In some stories, he's so horrified that he's been living with a woman who is half fish that he leaves her. And they part tragically. In some stories, she comes back to him. In my version, of course, she does, because it's such a tragic ending to the beautiful love story. But I also found when I was working it through the story, because since it's an archetypal legend, this is my retelling of it, it seemed to me to, to, to fit very nicely to my speculations about the fundamental difference between the natures of men and women and how, to me, women are very often beings of a slightly other world. And we do like a bit of time on our own. And we do need, in a sense, to nurture our own nature. And there's a line in it which just came to me when I was writing and just, you know, that to live in the world of men is hard on the feet and it absolutely is. <laughs> The question of magic runs through the novel. In a sense, Jaquetta believes she is a witch. Uh, her contemporaries believe she was a witch because they put her on trial and they find her guilty, and she would have been executed if Warwick had dared to, to do that. Um, Elizabeth Woodville, as her daughter, would have believed that she would have inherited powers. Consequently, all of the women who then become women of the House of Tudor would have this inheritance. So I think they think that they have power the people around them think they have power. We as modern scientific people think that that power doesn't exist. Okay, if that's what you think, you know, if that's what you're looking for, that's what you'll see. I don't personally believe that she blew up the mist for the Battle of Barnet, but I do think it was remarkably convenient. And I do think if she could have done, she would have done, and I'm sure she tried. The curse on Richard III, which is of Elizabeth Woodville's doing in the novel, is recorded by Richard III himself, who goes into the council chamber and says his arm is withered. In the Tudor version of history, which is the only version we've got, he claims that his arm has been withered by witchcraft and he blames a combination of Elizabeth Woodville and Jane Shaw, Elizabeth Shaw. So in a sense, that's on the record. We know that he thought she was doing that. What I suggest is that she was doing it. How such a curse would work out in our society, 
We don't know. We say it couldn't. There's an awful lot of societies in the world who believe it works just as it happens in the novel. Mm -hmm.